class lecture that one of the advantages of writing complex numbers in polar form is that uh, some proofs become very easy. Let's do that proof again of example 7, but this time we'll do it in polar form. We are required to show that the modulus of z times w equals the modulus of z times the modulus of w. Well, writing z in polar form, we'll write it as r1 e to the i theta 1, and w in polar form, we'll write it as r2 e to the i theta 2. Where the r1 is the modulus of z, r2 is the modulus of w, theta 1 is the argument of z, and theta 2 is the argument of w. So multiplying z times w, we multiply r1 e to the i theta 1, times r2 e to the i theta 2. Put the r's together out the front, that's r1 times r2, and then we multiply the terms uh, with the e's. So we know that when we multiply terms of index form with the same base, we add the indices. So we'll end up with um, r1 r2 e to the i theta 1 plus i theta 2. Take the i out in the index and we'll get r1, r2, e to the i times theta1 plus theta2. Now the modulus of z times w, that is the number out the front, which is r1 times r2, and that's just the modulus of z times the modulus of w, and that's the result, and it's proved very easily in polar form. It's time for you to do an exercise now. If z equals r e to the i theta, Show algebraically that the conjugate of z, z bar, is r e to the minus i theta. And we'll use this result in exercise 6. I'll start you off and then you can stop the, uh, the video and have a go at completing the proof. Well, we know that e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta. We know that by definition, so we can write that z is r times all of cos theta plus i sine theta. Okay, that's enough help. You uh, stop the video, have a go at uh, the rest of the um, proof. Therefore, z equals r cos theta plus i times r sine theta. And the conjugate of z will be r cos theta minus i r sine theta. But cos of minus theta equals cos theta, and sine of minus theta equals minus sine theta. So using those results, we get that the conjugate of z is r times cos minus theta plus i times r sine minus theta. We can take the uh, r out the front of the brackets, we get the conjugate of z is r times all of cos minus theta plus i sine minus theta and that is of course uh, r e to the i times minus theta which we can write as r e to the minus i theta. So there it is, the conjugate of z in polar form is r e to the minus i theta. In this exercise you're asked to prove a result that we've seen before that's z times the conjugate of z equals the modulus of z squared for all complex numbers z. But you're asked to do the proof by writing z in polar form. Well, I'll just start you off again. Let z be a complex number with modulus r and argument theta. Then z can be written as r e to the i theta, and we now know that the conjugate of z is written r e to the minus i theta. All right, stop the video now and you can complete the proof. It's quite easy. Hence, the product of z and its conjugate is r e to the i theta times r e to the minus i theta. But the right-hand side becomes r squared e to the zero because we know that when you uh, multiply terms in index form with the same base, you add the indices and i theta plus minus i theta is zero. So the e to the zero is one, and the r is the modulus of z. So the right-hand side must be the modulus of z squared times one, and of course that is just the modulus of z squared. So we have the result, z times the conjugate of z is the modulus of z squared. 
In this exercise, you're asked to show that the modulus of Z2 over Z1 is equal to the modulus of Z2 over the modulus of Z1 for all complex numbers Z1 and Z2, where Z1 is not equal to zero. But again, you're asked to show it by writing Z1 and Z2 in polar form. Well, we'll do that. Let Z1 equal R1 e to the i theta 1 and Z2 equal R2 e to the i theta 2, where R1 and R2 are the moduli and theta 1 and theta 2 are the arguments of Z1 and Z2 respectively. Since Z1 is not equal to zero, then its modulus R1 will not be equal to zero. Now we'll write the uh, terms, we'll write Z2 over Z1 equals R2 times e to the i theta 2 over R1 e to the i theta 1. Now you can stop the video now and complete the rest of the proof. The right hand side gives us R2 over R1 times e to the i theta 2 minus i theta 1. And that's because we know that when you divide terms in index form with the same base, you subtract the indices. So, so the modulus of the right hand side is just the number out the front, which is R2 over R1. So the modulus of Z2 over Z1 is just R2 over R1, but we know that R2 is the modulus of Z2, R1 is the modulus of Z1, so we've got the result. The modulus of Z2 over Z1 equals the modulus of Z2 over the modulus of Z1. And this is, of course, when Z1 is not equal to zero. So we can see that by writing the complex numbers in polar form, the proof becomes very, very easy. This example is more difficult but it does show us how we can use some of those properties that we've already developed. If Z and W are complex numbers, show that the modulus of Z plus W all squared plus the modulus of Z minus W all squared equals twice the modulus of Z squared plus twice the modulus of W squared. Now, as before, we'll take one side and prove it equal to the other side. We'll start with the left-hand side, which is the modulus of Z plus W all squared plus the modulus of Z minus W all squared. Now, we remember that property 2 said that the modulus of a complex number squared was equal to the product of that complex number times the conjugate of that complex number. So we'll use that and we'll write uh, the modulus of Z plus W all squared as Z plus W times the conjugate of Z plus W. And we'll also write the modulus of Z minus W all squared as Z minus W times the conjugate of all of Z minus W. We can do that from property two. Now properties 3A and 3B they told us that the uh, conjugate of a sum was the sum of the conjugates and the conjugate of the difference was the difference of the conjugates. So we'll use that and we'll write uh, the uh, brackets as uh, Z plus W times the conjugate of Z plus the conjugate of W plus Z minus W times the conjugate of Z minus the conjugate of W. And that's using properties 3A and 3B. Now we'll just expand out all those brackets. So we'll expand out the uh, first bracket, break up the first bracket. Uh, you can uh, do that in, um, uh, in both cases there. And then we expand out the, uh, the, all the brackets there. And in the, we'll end up with Z times conjugate of Z plus Z times conjugate of W plus W times conjugate of Z plus W times conjugate of W plus Z times conjugate of Z minus Z times conjugate of W minus W times conjugate of Z plus uh, W times conjugate of W. And what we see there is that there is some cancelling. The terms Z times conjugate of W, they will cancel out, and the uh, W times conjugate of Z, they will cancel out, and we'll be left with 
twice z times the conjugate of z plus twice w times the conjugate of w. And using property 2 again, that is just twice the modulus of z squared plus twice the modulus of w squared, and that is the right-hand side, and the property is proved. A complex number is said to be purely imaginary if its real part is zero. For example, 2i, that's really zero plus 2i. Another example is minus one-third i. These are numbers are purely imaginary. When the purely imaginary complex numbers are plotted on the Argand diagram, they all lie on the imaginary axis. That's the vertical axis. Let's do an example involving a purely imaginary number. Let x and y be real numbers, but not both zero. Show that 1 over x plus i y all squared minus 1 over x minus i y all squared is purely imaginary. Now this expression is just the difference of two fractions, and we know how to do that. We get the uh, common denominator. So the common denominator will be x plus i y all squared times x minus i y all squared. And then we'll make the numerator, it will be x minus i y all squared minus all of x plus i y all squared. Now we'll write the denominator as x plus i y times x minus i y and all of that squared. And we'll expand out the squares in the uh, numerator. They'll give us x squared minus 2i x y plus i squared y squared minus all of x squared plus 2i x y plus i squared y squared. Continuing on, in the denominator, the two terms in the round brackets, they'll multiply together to give the difference of two squares. That's x squared minus i squared y squared, and that will be all squared. And on the top, we'll have x squared minus 2i x y minus y squared minus all of x squared plus 2i x y minus y squared. So uh, that's replacing the i squared by minus 1. Getting rid of the brackets in the top there will give us x squared minus 2i x y minus y squared minus x squared minus 2i x y plus y squared. And the denominator will become x squared plus y squared all squared when we replace the i squared by minus 1. There will be some cancelling and we'll end up with minus 4xy times i all over x squared plus y squared all squared. And of course there's no real part here, so that number is purely imaginary and that's what we're asked to prove. It is interesting seeing the uh, proofs done in uh, polar form and comparing them done with uh, Cartesian form. So I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. If you have not already subscribed to our channel, can you please do so? Now in my next lecture, lecture 5, I'll be talking about factorizations of uh, the polynomials and uh, the equations. So the uh, sorts of equations we'll be dealing with are simultaneous linear equations with uh, complex coefficients and we'll do those in two methods, that's the elimination method and uh, Kramer's rule. Also, we'll be doing uh, uh, quadratic equations and uh, the factorization we'll do of quadratic expressions and cubic expressions. Uh, so don't miss lecture five.